Uh, it is my challenge to present to you briefly on Achilles tendon lengthening uh, as the closing video presentation for this morning's session. Uh, this is a workhorse mainstay procedure that if done properly can complement your surgical practice in many, many ways. Uh, if done improperly, as many of us are all too painfully aware, uh, can be a significant problem uh, and have significant complications. So that is the focus of the next few moments, is to show you perhaps some of our uh, pearls uh, from the operating room of do's and don'ts with tendo Achilles lengthening. <clears throat> Uh, I have no disclosures. So neuropathy plus deformity uh, is a very challenging clinical scenario. And we deal with this, uh, for many of you, probably in the majority of your clinical patient population. It is critical to properly examine for ankle equinus. Uh, we find that our students and residents are unschooled in this from their basic medical training. Uh, and it is not an instinct to check in the diabetic foot with a plantar wound for ankle equinus. And it should be, and probably is for most of you in this room, an instinct to check that ankle range of motion. Uh, that is, has to be documented as part of your cl clinical examination and perhaps made part of your clinical treatment plan. So we try to address equinus early, and we try to address it consistently. Uh, it is a part of a, an adjunct to many of our surgical procedures in the operating room. Uh, keep in mind the Achilles tendon is indeed the largest tendon in the body. It is subject to significant end products of glycosylation. Uh, much publication has been done on this, electron microscope scanning examinations, looking at the Achilles tendon and seeing the physical change from glycosylation of the Achilles tendon, and it is very significant. Uh, keep in mind that the same feet that we're talking about uh, being at risk for Achilles pathology are the same feet that are at risk for an intrinsic minus foot type, so therefore less able to equip themselves with protection to the forefoot from increased plantar pressures, and also these are the same feet that are challenged and plagued with autonomic neuropathy. So there are many reported risk factors for ulceration as documented in our literature by many of you in this room. Uh, and thanks to recent work in the past few decades, there are many surgical repairs that can be made to eliminate that risk factor for ulceration. You've just seen some tremendous presentations on how we can surgically fix the risk factor of vascular disease. And what I would like to present to you is in the middle point of that slide, looking at where we can address limited joint mobility and perhaps partially address foot deformity with this adjunctive procedure of tendo Achilles lengthening. So a few brief uh, seconds here on anatomy. Uh, again, looking at uh, the examination, we'll talk about that in the next slide as well. This is a very subjective clinical diagnosis. There have been many attempts to quantify and objectify equinus at the ankle, and in my opinion, they either all failed or they're completely impractical to use in the clinical arena. So this really does come down to eyeballing what is the angle between the long axis of the foot based off the lateral glabrous junction and fifth metatarsal, and what is the angle with that compared to that of the long axis of the fibula, as you can see drawn out in this slide. So uh, for goniometric measurements, this is a device that basically is an angle finder, and we're all uh, accustomed with this. But again, it is a very, very subjective, and I can tell you this is not something I routinely carry in my lab coat, whether I'm proud or not proud to say that, uh, because I find this exam to just be so subjective that uh, it's more important to me what this looks like uh, in my opinion, rather than what angle a student or resident is coming up with on their examination. The uh, uh, location of the subtalar joint, whether the foot is in neutral or not, uh, is a major impact on this. And as you can see from this slide, differentiating from gastric equinus versus gastric soleal equinus with the knee extended versus the knee flexed. So briefly, uh, I'm going to show you a video of uh, my colleague uh, and uh, mentor at Georgetown, uh, Chris Adinger, uh, uh, performing uh, in the operating room a video of the Aquinas exam, obviously starting off with the leg extended, and then you can see, oh, go back. Can you help me go back a slide there? Yep. And then let's get the right spot here. There we go. So here you can see first doing it with the leg extended, now doing it with the leg, the knee flexed, and looking at the examination, you can see significant Aquinas. The ankle does not come up above neutral in this examination. So the Aquinas with this, uh, in these individuals, obviously, as we alluded to, putting together the factors of neuropathy with a structural and functional 
pathology of the Achilles tendon is going to yield increased forefoot pressure and the potential for midfoot breakdown. Uh, this has been discussed at length by Dave Armstrong and, and his co-workers and published extensively, uh, beginning very importantly with the Journal of Bone, Bone and Joint Surgery, 1998, really, really highlighting the effect of the tendon Achilles lengthening on forefoot pressures. Now, it should be differentiated between a percutaneous tendon Achilles lengthening or a HOC, modified HOC procedure that we oftentimes do, the triple hemisection. Uh, versus a gastrocnemius aponeurosis recession. Uh, very, many modifications of that uh, are practiced. Uh, we, in general, for most of our patient population with diabetes and significant forefoot pressures, will choose the percutaneous tendo Achilles lengthening because of the physical increase in ankle dorsiflexion that is achieved. The gastrocnemius uh, recession is a much more subtle procedure. We use this oftentimes in the non-diabetic population, uh, and we find it to be helpful, but not as powerful at reducing those plantar forefoot pressures, particularly in the partial amputee population. So the procedure, before we look at the video of this, just to give you some reference points, uh, many of you do this uh, on a regular basis, but we, uh, we prefer to do this in a prone position, but most often perform it in a supine position because we were doing some other adjunctive procedure on the same day as that surgical procedure, so we don't usually rotate the patient or flip the patient into a prone position just for this procedure. We'll elevate the leg and do it upside down. But in this particular uh, still photo, you can see the convenience of having the patient in the prone position uh, is significant. Uh, so we draw out the margins of the Achilles tendon. This is surface anatomy, very palpable, and we make our markings, which we'll discuss here in a moment. The photo on the right is a cadaver example uh, of converting this from the percutaneous procedure had been performed by a first-year PGY1 resident of opening that up and seeing what we achieved. And even in the hands of an uh, unschooled PGY1 resident uh, with proper guidance and proper use of landmarks, this can be a very precise procedure, which is truly a lengthening and not a tenotomy. You can see at each one of these sites here, you can see the, uh, the notch that has been created. Here is a pre and a post example, single suture of proline placed into each one of these small uh, percutaneous entry points. Let me click the right portion here. So looking now in the operating room, uh, this is uh, in the hands of uh, Dr. Christopher Adinger here and uh, being filmed by Paul Kim. The, the first marking that you see made there was the top of the calcaneus, so the, the high point of the insertion of the Achilles onto the heel. And then we're marking approximately three centimeters or two finger widths uh, each spacing from there. So my goal is to have the Achilles tendon lengthening incision points at three, six, and nine centimeters proximal from the Achilles insertion onto the calcaneus. We use a 15 blade. Uh, many of you may choose to use an 11 blade. I have since abandoned that. I find the 11 blade is a temptation to go far too deep. Uh, in general, uh, for most of our patients and their leg contours, a 15 blade is perfect to bury right up to the end point of the sharpened blade, and then you're at the perfect depth to catch the majority, if not all, of the tendon thickness. Uh, an 11 blade is going to uh, throw you far into structures and approximately may put you into muscle belly and cause unnecessary bleeding and tissue harm. Uh, so you can see here going in with the blade uh, parallel to the longitudinal axis of the fibers and then turning that blade uh, to either the medial or the lateral side. Uh, there's much opinion uh, but very little data to say which you should do medial, lateral, medial versus flipping that and doing lateral, medial, lateral. Uh, I, uh, in a teaching institution, uh, have found similar benefit to both, and I prefer, uh, I'm much more worried about what could be cut in a diabetic neuropathic patient on the medial side than what could be cut on the lateral side, and therefore, I do lateral, medial, lateral. Uh, Chris does just the opposite, so similar results, although Chris will always tell you that his patients do better. You can just ignore that. Uh, but the reality here is it's, it's certainly surgeon preference uh, for what you're going to do. You can see Chris here really taking some time to go into these points and not just making a stab or a nick and, and trying to do this. Is, this, is, this takes a few moments, uh, only a few moments, but it takes a few moments to do correctly. You can see here applying some pressure, not, uh, not shoving your whole body into this, but applying some pressure and it's not giving enough. Uh, so don't keep pushing until the point that it would snap. You're going to see here that uh, Chris is going to say, okay, we've, we've gotten some lengthening, but not enough. We're going to raise this back up. We're going to go back into those same three points, and we're going to come just a little farther towards the center, 
and we're number two going to check to make sure we didn't miss anything at the extreme lateral or medial aspect of the tendon. Most commonly you will miss the plantaris uh, and you, once you get that pop of the plantaris then you'll see your complete release. Uh, we want this to slide. Uh, we want this to actually form an appropriate lengthening rather than a tenotomy. On rare occasion, I will go ahead and make a proximal fourth stab. Uh, again, that's very rare. Uh, for the most part, we can get what we need out of these patients. You can see here he's palpating to make sure the cord of the Achilles tendon is still intact. Not to say that we necessarily would open and repair it if we had a tenotomy, uh, but it would just extend our recovery period of casting and immobilization. But you can see here a tendon is intact. Greater than 90 degrees dorsiflexion is achieved. So I, uh, I en enjoyed making this video, but I enjoyed this next seg segment even a little bit more because I know uh, our esteemed chairman, uh, David uh, Armstrong, uh, as many of you have suspected, has a bit of a flair for the dramatic. So this was nice and fun in making the video, but Dave, this is, this is your version of the TAL video here, sir. David, I, I'm going to call that going Hollywood on you, and uh, the tweet for that would be Steinberg just went Hollywood on me at DFCon would be, would be good if you're going to throw it in there. Uh, again, in all seriousness, this is a key part of a comprehensive plan for diabetic limb salvage. Uh, we use the tendo Achilles lengthening nearly on a daily basis, but uh, I implore you to, to make it a precise procedure and not a uh, guesswork procedure. I again want to thank uh, my co-surgeons here and videographer Dr. Kim and Dr. Adinger and all it took was one good Korean barbecue dinner to get that video out of them. Thank you all very much.